What's up guys, this is going to be the first in a video series explaining in more detail the capabilities, benefits, and detriments sometimes to each NEN category. I will try to keep these short so they should be coming out more quickly. First up, we'll be exploring the manipulation category. Those in the manipulator category of NEN can control the world around them, and hold the distinction of being able to put the most amount of NEN into a physical object or a person. When putting NEN into an object, it can be used to make the object move at will, in a telekinesis-like fashion, change its shape, color, or function, and typically will have a great amount of destructive power, as the basic shoe technique allows, for instance. More common than using objects as a method of attack, manipulators using objects are scariest because of their ability to incapacitate an opponent with one blow. Examples of these techniques would be Shalnark's Black Voice or Illumi's Needles. Objects used like this must be of particular significance to the user. Outside of objects, manipulators can affect their own bodies to change their function or appearance, the most prominent being Illumi as Gitarakar or when he was impersonating Hisoka. Manipulating one's own aura is also an option, and typically these techniques utilize emission to allow for attacks beyond the user's normal range. For an outside example, Yamcha's spirit ball would be considered a combination of emission and manipulation, as would Knuckles' APR. If one uses a conjuration technique instead, then emission is not needed, but the object will be visible to non-Nen users. Recently in the manga, another more terrifying method of control has been explained, techniques activated by words or other special conditions. Think of this as functioning like Shinso's quirk from My Hero Academia, with the amount of control granted being directly related to the condition's difficulty. For instance, Shinso's ability, because all it requires for activation is a reply, only allows for uncomplicated commands and can be broken with sufficient pain or shock. With the introduction of this possibility, different types of manipulation have also been categorized. These are coercive, pseudo-coercive, and soliciting. Coercive is full control of a target, where one can make a person think, say, or do anything. Shalnark, Illumi, and Beisei all have techniques of this type. Pseudo-coercive is when the user takes full control of just the body, or makes the victim perform an action under extreme duress, as in, if you do not attack, you die. They have a choice, but not really. The last is soliciting, which does not grant control of the target, but changes their actions via subliminal influences, memory manipulation, personality change, or other ways of limiting choices. If I were to explain this as a D&D spell, it would be charm person or friends, but the victim likely would be unaware of the effect, unlike friends or charm person. The needle placed in Kilua's head by Illumi is of this type. It only activates in moments of extreme danger and only makes the target feel fear, making fleeing the likeliest course of action for the target. Since this power requires physically attaching something to the victim and is limited to minor influence, it was both long-lasting and long-ranged. As manipulator abilities, especially those that solicit, are both hard to detect and can be activated with simple conditions such as a special word or phrase, it makes manipulator abilities some of the most powerful in both espionage and direct confrontation. Those confident in their defensive capabilities like Uvogin or other master enhancers would be wise to not give their opponent the free time to fulfill their conditions. For a small section on weaknesses, I would say manipulators having very, very specific conditions or dangerous conditions makes them slightly weak, but I think they're so powerful that it doesn't really matter, and with the introduction of these new categories, they become a lot more dangerous. 